Hey, welcome to another episode of the Governing Channel. My name is Abraham Xiong, where we teach you the language of government contracting here on this channel right here. In today's episode, we have our guest, Mr. Keith Scott, where he shares how he was able to leave corporate America after working there many years and was able to start a business, grew his company in the commercial market and expanded to the government sector. And he shares with us about how he is helping create digital equality as well as social equality through government contract and supporting business in the government sector. I'll see you on the inside. Well, hey, Crystal, it is time for Governees again, and I love our Governees uh, webcast channel here. Uh, it's always a joy to have you as a co-host here with me, Crystal. Uh, we get a lot of different guests, lots of fun people to come and talk about their experiences in the government space. And today, uh, we have a guest that you brought in. So uh, you want to kind of start off with that there, Crystal? Yes, 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 yes. I'm excited to introduce our uh, guest for today. Um, uh, our guest is Mr. Keith Scott. Uh, Keith is the founder and CEO of KL Scott and Associates, uh, LLC. He is an accomplished IT and management consulting uh, services leader with over 29 years of consulting experience uh, supporting the local, state, um, and federal government agencies. Um, he is a proven results-oriented leader and has an excellent track record of optimizing client performance through strategic planning, organizational transformational services, um, operational process improvements, and information technology strategy. Um, Mr. Scott has a long history of leading large-scale, time-sensitive, um, highly visible uh, and complex solutions to make clients uh, successful with over 50 government clients served. Uh, Mr. Scott was a has a bachelor's um, in computer science from North Carolina A&T uh, State University. You can do your, you wanna do your Aggie thing? You know how you yeah. do it. Yeah. I'll um, save it for the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and an MBA in organizational strategy from Mercer University. He is also a certified PMP um and has a certification in business analytics from uh, the university of california at berkeley berkeley's haas school of business and i would like to welcome keith to our webcast welcome keith thank you thank you i'm very excited to be here i love uh, just talking so let's get it going <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Well, well hey, I, I noticed that you have your own podcast too, Keith. So why don't we start there? T t tell us about your podcast and what you do there. Yes. So, so we have a podcast called The Citizen Experience, and we'd love to have both of you on there uh, soon. Uh, we, we basically have been interviewing uh, mayors, city councilmen, uh, government officials and leaders on a variety of topics. And lately it's been, uh, you know, around diversity, equity, inclusion, and that's kind of taken a, on a life of its, of its own. And uh, so we like really kind of putting it together as a think tank, you know, sort of like this podcast with government contracting. So we can really talk about things to make the citizen experience better, right? And we're talking, it covers health equity, it covers, you know, public safety, uh, social policy. So if you are a government geek like me, uh, you know, join the podcast or uh, tune in. It's on all platforms. Okay, super. Yeah, yeah. We'd love to uh, check it out. I actually, I watched one of the episodes uh, earlier. So yeah, so, I, so, so it was good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for the support. Oh, spread yeah, the word. <laughs> and spread yes. the word. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so tell me, I mean, you, you've got a long history of uh, public uh, service in terms of the government contracting space. Tell us how you started your business and why you got, got, got into business in the first place. Well, I, I, I've always wanted to have my own company, right, since the age of 12. And right? that's kind of odd, but mm -hmm. is the case. And I, I really got it from my influence. Have you ever read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Yep, book? one of my favorite books. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of tells my, my life story of my father and my uncle, right? So my father, greatest father you can ever ask for, uh, not a businessman, but just an incredible father, always there. Um, my my uncle, incredible businessman, right? So uh, multimillionaire, he's, he's enjoying the, the fruits of his labor and his retirement now. But when I was a kid, I was just going to his house and I'm like, there's a lot of cash on the table, <laughs> you know? So, you know, inquisitive minds want to know. So I was asking him about, you know, his businesses and things like that. And 
so he was in a lot of different things, um, entertainment, uh, you know, uh, restaurants, real estate. But I wanted to parlay it into something I love, which was technology. So at that point, I had the Commodore 64. Remember the old Commodore 64? Mm, absolutely. And, uh, give me away my, <laughs> my age here. So my parents um, bought that for me, and I was a little spoiled and, and fortunate child, right? So they, they kind of spoiled me with all the technology. So I just stayed in my room, wrote programs, uh, really got around com computer science, and it just never really left me at a young age. So then as I saw the independence that my uncle uh, earned through his entrepreneurship, I said, yeah, that's kind of the, the, the way I wanted to go with the rest of my life. Because I saw him make more of a social impact by being a business owner versus, um, you know, just being someone who's an employee. Now, there's nothing against that. You can make an impact there too, but everyone has their own path, their own way of really uh, driving uh, their mission, their life mission or life purpose, right? So that's kind of where the, the genesis came from. And as I got older, I saw that I, I could make more of a social impact by going through uh, and partnering with government agencies at the local, state, and federal level. So I've just really kind of married married the love of both entities together. So. Well, yeah, you, know, you know, everybody has somebody that inspires them, you know, from a young age. And so I'm glad you had your uncle there. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I had I had different people that influenced me. Also, I remember uh, we immigrated to the U.S. and mm -hmm. I can kind of relate a little bit to your story about just having someone that's a example of entrepreneurship for you at a young age mm -hmm. i was about uh, 13 years old uh, about your age there yeah and i was walking down the street and very limited english skills at that point because we just came to the u.s a, a few years earlier yeah. right and I'm walking down the street and the stranger you know he probably have seen me walk down the street many many days mm -hmm. so he decided to say hey kid you're looking for a job mm -hmm. i'm a 13 year old kid i'm not looking for a job <laughs> You're looking for candy, right? Looking for a job. right. <laughs> and so being the, the smart person I am, I said, yeah, of course. So he said, let me give you my business card and you talk to your parents. And if they say it's okay with you, come to this address on Saturday and I will give you a job. So Saturday, I went to his office, uh, talked to my parents. Uh, I went to, and then I went to his office on Saturday and he said, I'm going to hire you. Uh, I pay me $3.15 an hour for about four hours of work. Uh, and the first thing he did was, hey, wash my car. So I just washed his car. And then after that, he said, clean the toilet. And so I cleaned the toilet. And so he, he, he taught me little things about hard work, right? About what it means to be a business owner. And then eventually I graduated from that. And, and he started showing me about how he runs his business. Uh, started uh, to help me, you know, ask me to help in different areas. And then when I turned 16, he gave me an account, a client account for me to go and service the client account. So, 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 so he became a mentor for me Yeah, at a very young yeah. age. So, yeah. so I appreciate you know, people who are successful as entrepreneurs mentoring other people. Yeah. And, and I do that a lot now because, um, you know, I really, you kind of like that gentleman saw in you kind of potential uh, you mm -hmm. probably he was probably watching you for a while and saw a lot of potential in you and then you know took the initiative to to reach out and and you had to do the work too right so mm -hmm. right. you know that that's a that's a good part of of what we do is really kind of reach back and pull the future forward so yeah i love that i love that love that story love that story mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think that's it so so, Krista, you, you started off a little bit later as an entrepreneur. So what was your experience like? You know, well, what, I did. what kind of seeds did you have? Well, see, that's interesting because you guys did have that. Um, I didn't. You know, I didn't have somebody, you know, that was close to me that I saw that was an entrepreneur. So, yeah, I did get started a little later in the game. I, I feel like had I had what you guys had or seen it, I would have started earlier. So. Mm -hmm. um yeah it it you know what we see growing up does you know affect us and um that's why now I try to be what you guys you know had to uh especially young black females because I didn't have that 
Um, and so every chance I get to speak to, um, you know, high school students or uh, college students, I, I do that. And I've been doing that this year specifically a lot more than I have before because it does matter. Um, and so, yeah, kudos to you guys. I'm glad that, you know, you guys had that. But yeah, that was, that was, I got started late, but I'm here. Yeah, you're here. You're at the party. You're at the party. Hey, I want to take a minute to say thank you to our sponsors of the Governor's channel here. And if you're watching this here, please visit our sponsors because they make it possible for us to do the Governor's channel. Our first sponsor is the Government Contractors Association. The Government Contract Association or GCA is a national trade association comprised of commercial contractors, small and large companies, and government agencies, federal agencies, state agencies, local agencies, government staff, universities, nonprofits, and many other entities out there. Their vision is to create access to help small businesses to get into the government market, to open doors for commercial companies into the government marketplace, and to support government agencies in accessing more qualified contractors. Their mission is to educate, facilitate, and advocate for their members based on becoming the premier government contract association with their three pillars. Learn more about the Government Contractor Association at govassociation.org. G-O-V-A-S-S-O-C-I-A-T-I-O-N.org. Govassociation.org. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and I think everybody has their own journey, right? And it, for, like for you, it's probably meant that you needed to be in corporate America uh, so that that can be your foundation to become an right. entrepreneur. Right. And, and, and I look at it as you getting paid to become an entrepreneur. Whereas Keith and I, we, we, we went through the school of hard knocks, right? We, <laughs> we, we, we didn't get paid to become an entrepreneur. You got paid in your professional career to become an entrepreneur. So, so but everybody good. has their own time. So, you know, and, and for all of you who are listening and who are current entrepreneurs, you have your own journey. And for some of you who are aspiring entrepreneurs, you have your own journey. So, so it's never too late. It's, it's, you know, it's at your own perfect timing. You know, and that, that's funny because I, I've done both. I've worked for big four firms mm -hmm. and, and consulting firms with the kind of the um, idea of going to school to get my MBA. Right. I, lo I looked at it just like that because mm -hmm. Deloitte, which is a great one, I think it's ranked like number in the top five consulting firms and it, you can interchange McKinsey and, and BCG and whatnot. But working for them taught me a lot. And then there was Gartner and working for Gartner uh, taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot about uh, things that just, just you know, going off on your own um, without that background knowledge. Um, I may have gotten to where I am at a slower pace, but that was, that was to me an additional MBA. Uh, mm -hmm you know, for, for me um, yeah. and doing that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, what corporations do is what they have that's an uh, advantage over small businesses is they have processes, standards in place. They have, uh, you know, they have departments, they have organizational structure, they have systems. Right. And, and so small businesses don't have those things there. And so exactly. that's what you saw, right? Exactly, structure. Mm -hmm. the 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 engine if you will on how this operates effectively it, it you know it's a, another book that i read is called the e-myth I, I i i know crystal i keep telling you about this book I, it's yeah. like the bible <laughs> so it, it really talks about building your business as if it were a product that can live without you right so you know in, in dipping into corporate america temporarily you get to see how the system works in each department, you know, get your HR works this way, finance works this way, you know, your, your team on the ground, your consultants work this way, your recruitment, you know, it's a lot of interchangeable gears to the entity, right? And what that does, it helps me become a better CEO mm -hmm. because now I know how those systems work and I can put the right people in place to run those systems. The company that, uh, that we built, uh, we were founded in 2013, the company that we built, I have put the right people in leadership positions and I get out of their way and they just kind of update me and I chime in where I can add advice. And it's really to get to a point where, hey, this company can go on without me. Right. Uh, and that's what you want, right? You want to build that legacy. You want to build that engine because I want someone who may not even been born yet to come and run this company 
when I'm six feet under mm -hmm. and nothing but a memory to some people, right? I know that may be morbid, but ultimately that's, you know, being, being a minority business owner, it helps put opportunities more available to people that may not have them otherwise. True. Yeah. So, so that leads me to um, asking you about how you got started uh, in your business and you know, at what point did you decide to leave Hope America and, and start the business? You said 2013, but tell me a little bit about the why and why you chose that time in there. Yeah. So I had, I had another business uh, right after Deloitte and then um, I, I, I divested from that business and then started the company we have now. Um, I really went to Deloitte knowing that I'm going to learn. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a, let me take a step back so that I can educate myself and become a greater, better uh, consultant, better business owner, because I, I'll understand how the big four does it. Mm -hmm. And I'll incorporate that into to our system. And that's exactly the intent. So it was persistence and patience, right? So the, one of the things that's hard to do when you're in corporate America is sit in a meeting with you knowing that knowing that you have the intention of, of taking what the knowledge that you're gaining here and incorporating it into your company, but having to work with individuals who are trying to go up to partner or principal and they have different, um, they have different, you know, they're, they may interpret your lack of enthusiasm of becoming the president of the company as disinterest, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas you're really just trying to learn. Right. <laughs> you, you, right. you really are. And um, so it is, it is kind of operating on, in that aspect, but learning and keeping your eye on a prize on your long-term plan. I'm mm -hmm. huge on long-term planning. I, I, I have, you know, you know, things I want to accomplish this year, next three years, five years, 10 years, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, but it, it, it is with that idea of, okay, I've never, I never wanted to go up the corporate ladder. So my motivation is a little different than others who may be in the same company. Mm -hmm. Well, good. So, so tell me about how you transition from, I, I, I noticed you, uh, you know, got in, did you start immediately in the government space or did you start the commercial and then transition to government? But sh share, share with our listener about that experience. Yeah, I started, I started with um, telecom and once you're in an industry, it's hard to, it's hard yeah. to get out of the industry. Um, I, I, I started working with Deloitte uh, back in 2006 and had an opportunity because prior to that I was telecom and insurance, right? Mm -hmm. Or financial services. But I had an opportunity to work with government and I saw the the avenue where uh, the buyers were more had more uh, of a, a potential to purchase from me. Right. Because there were more minority representation in government than in the private sector. And I'm always the path of least resistance. And then there's the social aspect of I can make more change in the world by sh shifting gears. So. Deloitte was that transition into the public sector. Um, otherwise, I probably wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, I would have found a way, but it, that that was the actual way that worked. And I haven't looked back since. And I built I built a network of of public administrators, city managers, uh, mayors. Uh, we're we're going to be uh, flying out to the West Coast. I won't name drop right now, but uh, meeting with the council mm -hmm. and uh, the the mayor there to help uh, DE&I strategy, right? It's because there's there's aspects of that that's so political that they need support and help uh, with that. So, you know, this is really where we found our lane and mm -hmm. uh, we stay in our lane. Yeah. So, 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 so tell us about your first government contract and uh, how, how, how that went and uh, what your experience with was that first government contract. So that that's a good that's a good thing. So my first government contract was with a former Deloitte client. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I think uh, I've, I've passed the area where they can sue me. But um, <laughs> the 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 partner wanted to ask me to not tell the truth on an engagement um, to the client. So I was in the middle of 
personal conflict uh, in, in morals and values versus being, you know, honest to the client. Mm -hmm. The client, and the, and the thing about it is sometimes people make the assumption that people can't see through BS. Well, uh, because I would not lie, the person took me off the project and kept their team and put another leader there that would lie, right? Mm -hmm. So I left, I left them and they hired my firm to be the IVNV for their system development because we knew where the bodies were buried. And the first thing that, that she said to me is, I knew this person brought you off the team because you were honest with me. And I never forgot that and hired us. That launched our company. Wow. That's amazing because uh, the your story kind of resonated with me a little bit. Uh, one of my very first business, yeah, I've started a few small businesses, but my, my very first more successful business was the office furniture company. And I was working for a company. We were selling office furniture to uh, you know, corporate America. And I'm a, I'm a, at that time I was working as a purchaser for them, right? So in the office, use office furniture. Uh, like for example, if it's a big company like, um, AT&T that if they're downsizing or they're maybe upsizing, it doesn't matter, but if they're, they're making a hundred employees move from this department to another department and they're uh, moving everybody over to another, they have a hundred stations of office furniture, whether it's desk cubicles or what, that has to be some, someone has to do something with that there. Mm -hmm. and, and so as a furniture liquidator, we would buy that and then we would, we would uh, inventory it and then we will resell it back. And so when we buy that, we buy like pennies on the dollar. We pay yeah. used furniture, like an office cubicle is probably about $3,000, but we pay about a hundred bucks for it. Hmm. And then we bring it in, we clean it up, we put new fabric on, we put new laminate on and make it look brand new. And then we sell, instead of 3,000 back out there, we sell it for like $900 or $1,000. So, so, so the customer, the new customer, is almost brand new furniture and they they save a tremendous amount a third of the cost usually mm -hmm. so, so so i was in that position uh, buying and selling and in used furniture liquidation we don't sign contract our word is our bond because in the industry mm -hmm. it's kind of like the diamond industry where mm -hmm. uh, your your diamond dealers they just their word is their bond and the mm -hmm. industry is kind of small uh, in terms of at that at that level now many people buy diamond Many people buy furniture, but at the dealership level, right. everybody knows everybody. So, right. so in, in that role and capacity, my word is very important to my, my partners in the industry. So, so there was an opportunity to buy uh, about three trailers of furniture. And I talked to the owners of the company. I said, hey, I'm, I want to buy these furniture for us. It, it's a good deal. And they said, yes, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I took their word. And I, I made it as my word, and I went to the partner. I said, the, the other dealer partner, I said, hey, we will take this here. Mm -hmm. and, and based upon that word, they will just send us the product without, without a contract, without uh, any, any written transaction. It's just words. Mm -hmm. so, so then I went back. It was time for them to deliver. It was, and then it was time for, them to, for us to pay them. Uh, I went back to the owners of the company. I said, hey, you know, remember that deal we talked about? It, you know, I, I need I need you to allocate the funds so we can pay for it. Well, as it turns out, they said we don't want the deal anymore. Mm -hmm. so, so, and I said, well, I understand, but this is going to really mess up our reputation in the industry. Yeah. They said, well, it doesn't matter. So, so in that situation, um, when he, when he said that, I said, you know what, I'm going to resign, and I my if my word can be trusted in this industry, I'm going to resign. So I resigned from that position. And I and then and then I went out there and I decided to start my own business. And then as it turns out, because of my integrity in that situation, that company that I left that my first year of business, they became my largest client. Wow. <laughs> because the, because wow. they know that I, I can be trusted yeah. with what I say I'm gonna do. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, by having personal uh, integrity, um, being, uh, you know, 
do do your best. You know, it, it, we we all make mistakes. We all do things that may not always be right, but but willing to learn from it, overcome those things there as well. So it's it's kind of interesting how you yeah, share that follows story. you. That that follows you wherever you yeah. go. Your integrity yeah. and your value system follows you wherever you go, and that's what you're known for, right? right. So uh, that and you know that supersedes any company, any anything that you do. Uh, your integrity and your values, right? And and it's good that it, it sometimes the good people win. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it, it's good. <laughs> so what is the list a for government? You know, when you're on that list, the bad list, the naughty yeah. list. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. 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 There is a naughty list in the government space. Like if you fail to perform or right. if you uh, abandon the projects or, you know, it's for many different reasons, fraud or many other things. So that list, they, they don't call it the blacklist. They don't, they, they call it the EPLS, yep. the excluded party listing system. And, and that's kind of important because you know, if you're looking for a teamy partner, in the government space, because you know, seventy percent of government project requires two or more companies to work together, mm-hmm. and so before you decide to work with someone, for those of you who's listening to this uh, webcaster, you might want to check out you know the EPLS. It now is merged with SAM.gov, so it used okay. to be a separate database, but now it's merged with SAM.gov. And type in the business name to see if it says the party is excluded. Uh, is part of the exclusion database, and that means they cannot do government contracting work. So you don't want to partner with someone that is on the list there. So right, right. Yeah, that is a good resource. I, and, you know, it's funny as we build teaming partners, um, you know, it's a it, it can be a painful process, right? Because like Crystal and I have known each other for a while, so there's a lot of trust there that we built over over the years. Anyone that that's new that comes in, you got to do your homework, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. because the first engagement could be the last, you yes. know, so it, you really so we do a lot of teaming and we like integrating our um, our company with the others like like Crystal has access to a lot of our resources and and, and vice versa. And we just say when anything pops up that kind of fits that um that that partnership capability we we call each other like hey you know let's let's look at this let's do a deep dive and and you know that's the type of trust that you want because we we look at it as the 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 big whale is enough for everyone to feast uh, yeah. off or eat and um and and that's kind of how we approach it so there's a lot of work that the federal government needs and they do need good um suppliers and, and vendors to work with you know, it's a three trillion, I think it's three trillion a year budget that that yeah. comes yeah, exponentially grows. Yep. And you know, imagine if if you can become more efficient, that's more tax savings, and that 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 would not the deficit and debt would not grow at the at the level if 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 we as a vendor community can really help the federal government operate in an effective and efficient manner, right? Um, you know, things like COVID are things that are outside of anyone's control Mm -hmm. but you know there's daily operations that happen and repeated over and over again there's better ways of doing things right now like you know digital transformation and and helping automate processes and giving people the right tools and tool sets to to do their job more effectively that can really help you know the federal government so not getting on that list should be the objective of every vendor (laughs) target Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, talk about trust and relationships. Uh, I noticed that part of your team, you're working with Tanya Morris. Uh, yeah. I've, I've known her for a few years. So, so tell me how you and Tanya met and, and, and how, why you guys decided to work together. It's a small world. You know, it really is a small world. And uh, Tanya and I hit it off really quickly. She's so, so good at, at HR and diversity and equity inclusion. And so we've we kind of framed the practice around uh, workforce equity and in other areas of equity too, but she's been leading a lot of our our, our work together. Um, and I, again, it was an instant. You know, this person it, one enjoys what they do, mm-hmm. understands the mission, right? Like I, I, we don't want to work with anyone that's totally focused on money. Right. That, 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 that's their entire motivation is to get rich, get rich, get rich. That should be a, a offshoot. Right. If you're doing the right thing, that's a result of, you know, trying to to make the impact that, you, you know, 
and, and she falls into our value system. Mm-hmm. So that's how we, we kind of hit it off. And we've been doing a lot of work together. Um, I think we, we, we're on five or six projects as a team. Mm-hmm. So. Awesome. Yeah. I, I have a great tremendous respect for her. So, yeah. so I, I, was, I was excited that in preparation for our conversation today, I was excited that she was part of your team. So I said, Hey, yeah, you know yeah. what, if he's tied to Tanya Morris, you know, Keith, I'm going to get along well. So yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exactly. Good. Exactly. Shout so, out to Tanya. Yeah. <laughs> hey Tanya, I, I've talked, I've had conversations with her for you once, I believe so. So yep. hey Tanya. Uh, yeah. you know, we, we're talking about the DEI space, and and like you said, that is you guys' lane. So you've been doing uh, a lot of work um, in that area, I believe. You know, local, state. Um, mm-hmm. Have you done you done federal as well? Yes, yes. Okay. So yes. just I just wanted to hear a little bit more about about that work, and uh, just yeah, tell us a little bit about what's going on because I know last year, uh, President Biden put in that um, right. executive order thirteen nine eighty five as it relates to. Uh, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. So it's it's good to see that small businesses are being tapped to help yeah. with that strat- those strategies. So just talk to us a little bit about what you've been doing in that space. And, you know, and I'm very appreciative of, of President Biden and his acknowledgement of the challenges that are yes. facing our society. Right. Uh, whereas, you know, other administrations may not have, have been as um, sensitive mm-hmm. or empathetic to it. So one of the things that we're, we're actually broadening that practice to not just focus on workforce, diversity, equity, inclusion, mm-hmm. we're looking at equity and we're looking at all aspects of equity and we're really rebranding, uh, you know, this is the first announcement here, right? Mm-hmm. So we're rebranding our practice to be social equity uh, consulting uh, advisory services. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're covering workforce equity, making sure that, uh, you know, in the public sector, Everyone has an opportunity to be compensated fairly, to have uh, success ladders where they can be represented and they, and they have a culture that's uh, inclusive and uh, one of belonging. The other aspects are really looking at equity from the public safety and justice perspective, where there's systematic uh, disparities in how individuals are viewed uh, in the criminal justice system. Like mm-hmm. I think a third of African-American males will be involved into the criminal justice system of some form. So we're looking at, you know, cause and effect relationships there. Are they over targeted? And we have another partner and Cobia group uh, that, that we work with on a lot of work uh, in this space. Then there's, um, you know, social determinants of health. So we do a lot of health equity work. So we're working with CDC on some strategic planning efforts. Uh, and also, again, with justice, we're working with uh, Alcohol uh, Tobacco Bureau um, and Firearms um, on some, some aspects there. There's environmental uh, equity that we're looking at and making sure that the social policies are, so, are not so bent at that uh, making a certain area or just this communities where that, that some p- pollution and, and other factors that are unbalanced in that in that community where that can cause uh, health disparities and health problems later through the environment there's economic uh, equity that we're making sure that all people of all uh, races genders uh, w- what have you have access to economic opportunities in a fair and balanced manner and uh, there's digital equity which is really a focus of ours as well and covid brought a lot of this to the table where you know i i, I my heart aches when i see uh, K through 12 students not have internet access, right. have to to have uh, access on a on a hotspot that right. has bandwidth that is not yeah. yeah that's not not acceptable. Mm-hmm. That creates a digital divide. I mean that really puts a more uh, division between uh, the haves and the haves not have nots because and I'm going to say it, we have more in common in based on race than mm-hmm. people really will give you credit for. Mm-hmm. The, the difference is really rich, poor. That's really the difference. Now, politicians may make the fight and, and change the messages and noise so it may, puts the other demographic uh, groups against each other. But it's really boils down to the rich and the poor. And the rich have access and the poor, they don't. So in order for the greater good of society to work, everyone should have access. Everyone should have a fighting chance 
to get to that upper echelon. You know, I'm a full capitalist, but having people without opportunities increases the jail system versus our economy as a whole. It goes into that circle. Let's broaden that circle. It's 360 degrees. The, let's, let's expand the di diameter and the radius of that, right? So that everyone can have opportunities. And that's really, you see the passion in, in what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. That's why we're doing it. That's exactly why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, I love your vision. I mean, this is so important, the work that you're doing. Um, yes. I'm a, because when you talk about social equity, it, it, it permeates through to all society. It, 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 right. it goes beyond the color of your skin. It goes beyond, exactly. uh, you know, it, it goes into health, digital, uh, economics, into all of those different things there. Uh, so I love what you're doing with that there. Uh, today is actually like, like my first time learning more about social equity. So mm -hmm. uh, that's actually really uh, interesting you know, for us to have this conversation. Like a lot of things that uh, we've done here at the Government Contractor Association is around economic justice, right? Mm -hmm. the, uh, and, and I firmly believe that a lot of our social uh, inequalities and social ills comes from the economic side of things in between yeah. the, the have and have nots, the, the rich and the poor. Uh, and so if we can fix the economic side of it, a lot of other things are a lot easier to fix. Uh, right. Uh, but, uh, but I like that you're taking a broader perspective uh, mm -hmm. because until until someone stands up for uh, other people, uh, true equity is not going to be achieved, right? We, we need our, um, our Asian community, the Asian American community to stand with the African American community. We need the African American yes. community yes. to stand with the, with the white community who, who, who lack digital. Yeah. Uh, you know, who lives in the rural area, but who lacks digital uh, equity. Exactly. Uh, and, and so take, take a trip all, through the mountains, yeah. the Appalachian Mountains. Just take right. a trip and try and call someone on your cell phone. Mm -hmm. You will not, it will drop. Trust me, mm -hmm. it will drop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My brother is in the communications uh, industry. And so now, I mean, the work that he's been doing for the last 10 years has been around this very thing. I mean, he's mm -hmm. up in the mountains of Georgia, laying the, the the framework and the groundwork yeah. and the cabling for uh you know these systems and i'm like when he first told me about what he was doing i was like you mean to tell me there are still people who don't have yep. internet access and who he was like oh yeah he's like yep. you know I, i'm i'm never going to be without work uh it seems and so yeah it's it, it's a it's a it's a real thing and it's, it really is good keith the work that you're doing it's very impactful and so when you're doing something that has impact, it, it does hit you here and it comes, it comes across, you know, your passion is definitely there and comes across and it's needed. So I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people who are going to appreciate you standing up in areas, having a voice for them where they can't speak for themselves. So that's what we have to do more of. And so I'm, I'm yeah, that's, that's awesome work. Awesome work. Yeah. It's really about being a voice for other people too. Um, like for one of the reasons why GC was founded was when, when I saw the statistic in the government space, I got into the government contracting space in 2000, late 2007, early 2008. Mm -hmm. and, and at that time, women owned businesses were only winning 1.6% of contracting dollars. Mm -hmm. wow, and, I, nice. and, and it broke my heart. I thought, you know, who's going to be, who's going to be the voice for yeah. my wife? for my right. daughter, for my sister, for my mom, my aunts, all the ladies in my lives. If I know the government space, I love the government space. Uh, if I don't stand up for them, who will? Mm -hmm. This right. is part of why I left consulting the government space to start up the government contract association is when you see an a, a area of injustice, mm -hmm. sometimes we think it's somebody else who's going to fix it, but sometimes it's us, right, Keith? You, know, you better believe it. Yeah. For other, yeah. other people. And so you take on that mantle and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take on this mantle. I'm going to lead this charge here. I'm right. going to make a difference. So very important yeah. what you're doing. And, yeah. and Barack, Barack Obama made a statement, um, and I'm going to tear it, brutalize this, but it, it was something to the effect of, we are the ones that we've been waiting for, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So we we have to take the the, 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 the ball and, 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 and run with it. I mean, we have to because we can't wait for others to to do it uh you know we may just be standing around the same balls and who's who's gonna pick this ball up you know mm -hmm. you know let's lead let's lead right 
Good stuff. So, so tell me about some of the lessons you learned, some of the challenges you've had trying to uh, trying to do government contracting work. Well, it's funny because um, this it, it, it's all cyclical, right? Because <laughs> one, you, you got to get the work, then you got to find the talent, then you got to pay for the talent, <laughs> right? So you, the 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 three legged stool is you got to find a good financial partner that mm-hmm. can fund your growth, right? Then you have to have a good pipeline of talented individuals that can deliver based on your vision. And you got to have these processes in place. So you also have to build the awareness that, hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. This is the value that we can bring to your government agency. Let's talk, right? So those three three things have to speak in harmony uh, to be successful. So there's a different challenge for each one of them. You're like I, one of the things I found out, again, maybe this is a different experience for others, but banks, as, as you're starting, banks aren't really going to help you, right? It's like, uh, in order for, for me to give you a $100,000 loan, you have to have $100,000 in the bank to borrow against mm-hmm. in order for you to, uh, to get the line of credit. You know, um, thank you, but that's not going to work for me. <laughs> so you have to find the, the right partner. And there's a lot of financiers that have products that fit, you know, what mm-hmm. you need, but that is, that is a challenge. And then the talent pool, particularly in, in this era, era where it's an employee employees market where they call the shots, it is hard to find talent. It is very hard because there's so much demand and people are, are, starting a job, leaving it for more money, more opportunity, you know, um, that that's a challenge today. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas before, not so much, but now, boy, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> We're yes. hiring right now, by the way. So if you're <laughs> watching this, send your resume to jobs at kalescottassociates.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what kind of position are you guys looking for? It's the social equity consulting work. Um, so a little bit about the, that type of consultant. We, we're, we're looking for someone who's a data, uh, kind of a data and business analyst that can take data and research data and, and regression analysis and, and financial models and really build a story around the data. We really work as data as the foundation to identify the inequities mm-hmm. and then build strategies on how to bridge those gaps to close those inequities. And that's really the, the that is what we do. That is who we're looking for to be part of our team. Okay, awesome. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're hiring. Um, I'm sure somebody listening to this here will say, hey, you know what? I need to get that. So <laughs> I'll, I'll put all of your content information onto the uh, onto this onto this webcast here at the bottom so people can access you. And, and I'll have you share that towards the end as well. So well, thank you. Thank you. So, so tell, me, uh, tell me one of your greatest success in the government space. Uh, I think I had a, a project with the Department of Education, and it was with the Office of Migrant Education. So I had the opportunity to go around the country. I think I went to 42 states in a matter of two years and spoke at conferences and worked with uh, education agencies because the migrant community at that time, as they moved from state to state, uh, their student records don't follow them. So we built a system at the federal level that will help um, help the states upload their their migrant student record to a federal system, and then the receiving state can download that you know same record so that there's continuity in their education process. Mm-hmm. The, unless you <clears throat> unless you've spoken with and sat down and and spoken with the challenges of individuals that are from that community you really don't know what they go through. I mean, it is a lot, right? Uh, it's hard work, first of all. And then the families are trying to, and you're often first generation, the families are trying to get their children to have a better future. Mm-hmm. The parents are, are picking the crops, you know, working uh, from sun up to sun down, really sacrificing us. And until you see that, you, you don't really understand how blessed and fortunate you are Right. as an individual to live and have have access to so much mm-hmm. but that was probably one of the biggest accomplishments and the most fulfilling work that i've done in my career thus far and also kind of leads into you know social equity but it really i i feel that i help uh migrant students 
not get disruption in their education. And I, I think that's that was very um, you know fruitful and 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 mission driven. So mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, that's meaningful. And and I know that um, we talk a lot about the you know those who have uh, you know documentation to legally be here and those that don't have documentation to leave, to be legally here. Uh, you know what how they got here that's a that's a separate conversation right but mm -hmm. while they're here they there's they have family they have needs right. um right. they they they're tied into the to the society and uh so so they they have real needs just like you and i mm -hmm. exactly so, exactly and their so, dreams are no different than you and i right, right. exactly yeah they 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 want to make a better you know you know, something better for their family. Same exactly. thing, same passion, same vision. So I'm glad you're doing those type of work there. Mm -hmm. So so if you have to give um, a few tips, if somebody says, hey, I, I want to get into the government space or I'm at, a, I'm at this point, I want to get to the next level of the government, you know, my government contracting endeavors, give us a, a few key, a key tips. I know you gave a few earlier, but give us a few tips in terms of what they can do. I So there's a couple of things that we do First, from a teaming perspective, we keep a database of all of our teaming potential teaming partners, and we have their credentials. You know, if you're looking at the the A column is all the the, the vendors, and mm -hmm. then cross columns is, you know, their certifications, their area of expertise, their current past performance, the clients that they're currently working with, so that when we get an opportunity, we go through this database and see who's the right partner for the right job right that's one building that infrastructure for teaming and then you know as you're running your company you got to look at i really stress um the e-myth book you got to look at you, you know growing your company at from the end backwards like reverse engineering it what is the vision of the company once it's complete and then going backward mm -hmm. and filling in individuals in those organizational boxes that can complete those roles as you grow now that's an internal you know, operation. Now, from an external operation, we have capability statements that we keep current, keep it simple so that the reader can really quickly gauge this is what you do and really focus on an area. Don't try to boil the ocean. Don't try to be all things to all people. We are the experts in this space. This is what we do. And it's really simplistic, mm -hmm. right? And this partner where you have gaps, right? Uh, that's the other thing that you got to keep that capability statement. Don't be afraid of subcontracting. Don't have be so egocentric that you're too good <laughs> to subcontract. Subcontracting is a fantastic way to get yeah. started uh, in the in the government space, particularly if you don't have a lot of the contract vehicles like GSA uh, mass contract, or if you're not certified like 8A or HubZone. Um, you know, think about your path long term is to get there, but to to get there, subcontracting should be part of that strategy. And be and just be generally uh, accessible to social events and get your word out there. Network, network. I know COVID, mm -hmm. we we are almost living in a postcode. I don't want to be too <laughs> optimistic, but it looks like we're we're coming out of that. Start getting out there and meeting people again. Right. Yeah, that's that's good there. I'm glad we are at that, uh, you know, looking at the, you know, more light in terms of coming out of this pandemic and being to be able to socially engage each other more in person there. So, 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 so you talk about keeping a list of teaming partners. Uh, how do you evaluate someone to be part of your team? I love referrals. One, referrals probably are the biggest way of me Mm -hmm. continuing to work uh, with a, a, a new entity. Mm -hmm. um, and then we look at um, in the networking events, we kind of do a, a try before you buy type of thing where we start engaging. And, you know, the thing about building these teaming partners is you're not always going to find an opportunity the next day you guys meet, you, you, right. you, your teams meet, you got to organically mm -hmm. get to know each other pursue opportunities together and give that time to fester. It's like a wine, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, it's almost like, uh, I'll put this recording and getting married too quickly, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you should cool. get married after, uh, uh, you know, the first date. You may want to take some time. You don't quite know the, the <laughs> individual yet. But if you if you 
pursue things together and that stays consistent, that's what you're looking for, the consistency, then that will organically grow into a true partnership and the trust will build over time. And that's really been our, our kind of approach to it. And we have, we have go-to teaming partners uh, like Crystal's project management, anything project management, you're on the, I'm on the phone call. We have a, we have a, uh, it's a bi-weekly cadence that we talk and just touch mm -hmm. base. And those are the things that you want to incorporate. Okay. Yeah. Team. I like the idea of bi-weekly cadence and uh, keeping the relationship warm and, and, mm -hmm. and keeping it genuine in that regard and building true friendships, right? You, you right. don't exactly. just call exactly. someone when you think you need them. No, right. I mean, a exactly. real relationship, you, you, you chat exactly. all the time. So Exactly. Right. exactly. All right. So if somebody is interested in um, uh, engaging you and, and maybe getting to know you, building a relationship for, for future opportunities, how do they contact you? And uh, so give us your email, website, and all of that good stuff. Sure. I will give you a website is www.klscottassociates.com. And we are going to be updating that website soon. Um, so it'll change a little bit. Um, my, our email address is partners at klscottassociates.com. So if you don't get me, you'll get one of our partners. Um, my email address is keith.scott at klscottassociates.com. And my mobile at, at the risk of being, uh, you know, blasted 678-360-4354. We are very open to teaming. Uh, we enjoy meeting new potential partners and going to market together. Uh, we value the social impact and the mission first, and that's who we like to partner with. people with our, who are mission driven first, mm -hmm. not money driven. So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's who we're looking for to partner with. And if you fit and want to be employed by our team and join our team, jobs at klscottassociates.com. We're looking for talent, as I said earlier, um, and just let's let's change the world together. Yeah, give me that phone number again. I, I want to make sure I got it. Yep, 678-360-4354. That's my mobile. And then our company is 404-692-5552. I hardly called the company. I know, right? So it's hard. Sometimes somebody <laughs> asked me for my phone number the other day, and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> so so the office is 3, 404-392-5552. 404-692-5552. 692-5552. And then your cell is 678-360-4354. Okay, got it. And check us out. We got a podcast, Citizen Experience. We're on YouTube, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts. Uh, we got a new series of uh, podcasts coming up uh, in the summer. So let's let's converse. Let's talk. All right, sounds good. So uh, do you have a website for your podcast? Or do they just go to your website? You can go to the website and you can you can have access to all the, the platform. Okay. All right. So we want to send people to your podcast as well. So that sounds great. Well, hey, any any questions or comments to Crystal and I before we wrap up here? I enjoyed talking. You know, let's let's definitely keep uh, the communication going. Uh, thank you for, for having me. Uh, I think you guys are doing great things because uh, the education that you're going to provide your listeners is invaluable. I mean, you can really uh, shorten the learning curve for a lot of people and avoid some of the pains that we've had to go through uh, in, in getting to where we are today. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, hey, it's, it was a pleasure having you. And uh, Crystal, thanks for bringing Keith on. Uh, so with that, uh, Crystal, final comments before we wrap up? Well, I just want to thank Keith again for um, being able to join us. He's a very busy person, so this was the, this was the first time I've been able to to get him for you know a long time. So it was, <laughs> it was very good having you. Thank you so much. Like you said, yes, we're going to keep the conversations going. Good work that you're doing. I'm, I'm super proud of you and the team. Um, great group of folks. Um, and so, like he said, if you if anybody is looking for a job in those areas, hey, you you need to get with uh, KL Scott and Associates. So, thank you so much again, Keith, for joining us. Thank you. All right, thank and you for all of the yeah, for all of you who's joined us on this Governor's uh, webcast here, thanks for joining us. Until next time, we will see you then. Our second sponsor is GovGenie. GovGenie, stop wishing, start winning. 
GovGenie is on a mission to democratize government contracting opportunities for small women and minority-owned businesses. Their objective is to change the disparities for small businesses in the $2 trillion government marketplace. GovGenie is like LinkedIn for government contractors. It is a social CRM unifying the fragmented government procurement lifecycle and uses AI and ML to help users to socialize, foster relationships, find bids, search for teaming partners, manage proposals, source industry events, and facilitate the capture management process. This saves you, the user, money and time with one streamlined platform versus nine many other disparate software out there. Learn more about GovGenie at GovGenie.com. G-O-V-G-E-N-I-E.com.